I'm just trying to rehydrate the Captain Jack. Poor old Captain Jack, his skin's so crusty and scaly. I'm gonna use some of this beauty cream to try to soften him up. And Captain Jack, there, there we go, Captain Jack. And Captain Jack, you know, he's hungry and I know he likes eggs, so I'm gonna try to feed him some eggs. Not hungry right now. Oh, you already finished off the brandy? I know Captain Jack likes the brandy. Mom, mom, are you calling? Mom, oh, it's time for me to go to school now. All right, Captain Jack, you take care of yourself. I'm gonna put you back in your tank. You stay safe now. Here you go, let's go back in the tank. We'll close you up nice and safe. Oops, close you up nice and safe. Hope nobody comes and uses the bathroom and flushes. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to Living Figuratively. This is the show that asks the question, why not fill your home with the fascinating faces and figures of people that you don't even know? Why not fill your home with figurative art? Tonight, we're also asking the question that my kids always ask me whenever we go on long car trips. Mom, you have to go to the bathroom again? And yes, tonight we are going to the bathroom again, and we do have to because we are taking a powder to the powder room, which if you don't know what a powder room is, this is where the, the word came from. Back in the olden days when people used to powder their wigs, you know, the white Mary Antoinette and George Washington hair, they used to actually have a room in the house specifically for that purpose because I guess it got really messy with all the talcum powder, so they wanted to keep it contained. Um, later, when they started to have indoor plumbing, the term kind of stuck, and when ladies wanted to go pee, they wouldn't say, oh, I have to go pee. They would say, oh, I have to go powder my nose, you know, put powder on your face. So that's where the term powder room came from. Here in this powder room, I want to show you some of the cool things we've done. This powder room is right off the laundry room. Uh, you didn't see it in the laundry episode, but I told you I would talk about it. And here we are maybe 40 episodes later, and I'm showing you all around. So the first thing I want to call your attention to in the laundry room, powder room, here I'm going to put all this junk in the sink, the alligator stuff, um, is the countertop that we have here and this whole mirror and the vanity. Uh, this, when we first built the house, Actually, before we built the house, one of the things that I found as part of our architectural salvage thing was this big, beautiful mirror. Um, it's a, it probably came off of vanity from the 1920s, and then it was painted with this white cream chalk paint. And I got it at um, White Magnolia, it, which is a cute shop with cute stuff in downtown Chagrin Falls. So I set it aside and I knew that it would take a place in my life. And when we started building our house, I planned for it to be in this bathroom. Now, at the time, I had ordered a cultured marble um, countertop, which is basically fake marble that's compressed into a shape. And it was in pre-made little, pre-made, pre-sized shapes. And it was, because I didn't want anything too, um, I didn't want anything too high personality. I just wanted it just kind of plain and white. I thought, why not do that? And the sink is all is all part of it too. So I got that, but when we put the whole thing together, this mirror had this overlap here, this overhang, and it sat in a weird way. And then it also, one of the things, it's, it had to park on top of the backsplash. And that was a little bit funky. It was just in, uncohesive. So one of the things that I did was I, because I didn't want to sort of reorder everything and change everything in midstream or like as we were close to the finish line, I had the carpenter cut me a couple of these little pieces to sit on the side just to kind of integrate the mirror a little bit more into the countertop. It was not perfect. It wasn't perfect, but at that point, I was just kind of like, we just want to move in. We just want to have this, you know, bathroom work. So, left it alone. 
12 years later, 12 years of looking at it, um, I just kept fantasizing and thinking how it should look, how I wanted it to look instead of how it did look. In fact, it's the way that I approach paintings a lot of times when I've kind of finished a painting, but there's just something that's not right. I put it up, I put it away, or I put it up, and I just keep looking at it, and I look back at it and sort of fantasize how I would have it perfectly if it was the way I wanted to you know, have it be. So that's what I was doing every time I came to the bathroom here. One of the things that I did love about this mirror right here, I'm gonna show you, is these rounded um, sort of 1920s Art Deco shapes. And I really wanted to echo that shape in the backsplash. And that is exactly what I did. When we decided to do the remodel, get the new countertop, I made sure that they knew that this is exactly what I wanted, this rounded shape. Uh, the marble that I chose is actually uh, granite. It's honed, not, um, not glossy. So the honed kind of gives it the look of the old marble that this vanity might have come from at some point. And the fact that it's a cabinet underneath here that also continues the old, you know, the, the look of a 1920s Art Deco vanity that, that I was just kind of going for with the whole, with the whole thing. Um, in the granite and marble world, one of the things you want to do, unless you have a big job, is if you just have a small job, you want to be able to fall in love with a remnant instead of a something where you have to buy a whole giant slab. Because like a whole giant slab of marble, it's really, really pretty big and it could be like $10,000. If you can fall in love with a remnant, meaning a smaller piece, it's way, 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 way cheaper and you don't have to buy the whole slab in order to cut off just a piece of it. So I went to O'Brien Cut Stone where they have remnants on their lot and I was able to fall in love with a remnant. This is called Thunder White and um, they, they, the O'Brien Cut Stone is a fabricator so they came out and to my very exacting anal specifications cut these rounded shapes right here and the rounded shape there at the end and then also this little detail right here where I wanted the rounded shape to fall just short of the end there to really look like a piece of furniture vanity. Um, and they did a beautiful job. They came, they installed it, and it was, it was all good. Now, during the install, there's a day where the old countertop is gone and the new countertop is coming. In that in-between time, one of the things that I had to do was to repaint the, the sides here, the wall behind it, because they had had to rip out the old one. So the wall was kind of messed up. Um, one of the things that I've always kind of resisted doing is doing repainting and touching up of paint. I've always thought that was just, oh, that's going to be too hard. That's going to be too whatever. Look fake. You know, it's, I'm not going to be able to match the paint. Well, here I said, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to give it a try. And it worked out way better than I thought. It really was pretty, uh, pretty easy and very successful. So what I did was, when they got the old countertop out, first I did some sanding. Why don't you come over here? You can show, see the, uh, the wall. First I did some sanding, okay? Sanded it all down, it was a mess. Then I used this wonderful stuff, which is called Fast and Final. This is for smaller amounts. You can just squeeze out a little bit. And then this thing is actually a speckling um, spatula where you can sp speckle it smooth. If you need larger amounts, which I did for here, I used a big can of it. So then you smooth it all smooth, let it dry, which only is about a half hour. Then you sand it down again. And make sure that there's no little bumps and stuff. You might have to put one more little coat of the spackle and then sand it down again. And then you repaint it. Now, I had fortunately kept the um, paint from the, you know, 12 years ago when we built this house. And the paint is tomato cream sauce, which I have in this small little yogurt container because it's easier to work with than a big can. And so I had kept the paint and I was able to repaint it. And so the big part, 
I used a small roller because I didn't want to repaint the whole wall. I didn't want to open up a giant can of worms. The small touch-up parts, I used actual paintbrushes from actual painting. And then one of the things that I did to blend it in, blend the color into the wall, was I feathered the edges. Here, you can show, I'll show you again. It's kind of tight quarters in here, but I kind of feathered the edges out. And when the paint was wet, it looked different. But I had faith that when it would dry, it would blend in and look the same, and sure enough, it did. So that was my paint in-between paint job. And then they came back into the granite, and it looks absolutely perfect and seamless and, and wonderful. But, so now you've come to see, you, can, you saw the, uh, the granite um, remodel, and now you're going to see the figurative art in the powder room. So, we have to close the door, and because it just is the powder room. So, the two pieces that I have on this wall, I mentioned before that tomato cream sauce was the color that we used in this, uh, Benjamin Moore tomato cream sauce was the color that we used in this room. It is also the same color, same can of paint, that I used in the backgrounds for these two paintings. This one is called Repentant on Tomato Cream Sauce, and the other one over there is called Pensive on Tomato Cream Sauce. I thought that would be fun little titles for these very, you know, tranquil model scenes. Basically what I did was I took masonite boards and I primed them with the tomato cream sauce, left a little bit of the masonite showing you know, to just sort of let people know that this is a prime thing. And then took it to life drawing groups and painted life drawings. I have a lot more of these and I, you know, just did different ones and these two happened to be, happened to be the best ones. So they got framed up and put in here. In fact, it makes me think of a fantasy commission project that I would love to have somebody commission me for where they have an interesting room with an interesting paint color and they give me a can of that paint and say here you know prime up a bunch of boards with it and take it to a figure session or hire a model to come over and do a whole bunch of life drawings on it and then they pick you know their favorite one and they buy different ones and the it's already made to match your house um, I did the exact same thing. I made it to match my house and you know, I wouldn't be insulted if you told me that because a background color is something that I can that I can work with. Um, so anyway, that that's fun. Uh, let's go around the room and we will look at the toilet over here, which is nothing special except for the fact that the first time a toilet was shown on network television was in 1956, of all times, on um, Leave It to Beaver. It was when uh, Beaver and Wally were, you know, had a pet alligator, Captain Jack, and they kept him in the tank of the toilet. They actually didn't show the seat of the toilet. They only showed the tank because I think the, you know, censors from, from 1956 couldn't handle the whole seat of the toilet. But anyway, hopefully Facebook will be okay with me showing the toilet. Um, but I thought that just was a fun little, you know, fun little detail, which is what I was doing at the beginning. So over here, over the toilet, I have more figurative art. This little piece right here, it looks like it has a, it's an all glass background so that you can actually see through the wall, but it actually is matte board, not tomato cream sauce matte board. It's really just, um, like a beige matte board that I had put on it. I painted this before tomato cream sauce color even came into my life. Um, but so that looks pretty cool with the, uh, with the barn wood. Then up on top of it, I have a little piece called Hail Mary, which was created as the, probably the very last thing that I did in a week long workshop with um, artist Karen Offit, who is one of my, you know, number one favorite artists and I collected a lot of her pieces. Um, when she held a workshop at Alia El um atelier down in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. So all week we had been inspired and influenced and did all kinds of wonderful stuff with Karen. And the last day I had finished my piece a little bit early 
and I didn't want to mess it up anymore. And so what I did was I pulled out one of my five by five uh, little boards and just did a little Hail Mary piece and um, framed it up and it, you know, came out really, really good. Or, you know, so I think um, it reminds me of the, uh, the cliche where an art patron would might ask a um, an artist, you know, how dare how come you charge so much for something that only took you twenty minutes to make? And then the artist says, well, you know, it's like it took me it took me a week of study of that model to come up with this magical twenty minutes, and it took me a lifetime of study of the principles of art to have plants align in this beautiful twenty minutes, you know piece of art that I created. And I don't think that there are any artists that can create a masterpiece every 20 minutes. It's sort of like the planets align and it happens, but you have to, you know, there's a lifetime of study behind it. So that is the cliche with that. Um, and I believe that is the completion of our 360 tour of the powder room. Next week, I want to make sure that you come back super duper same bat channel, not same bat time. Next week is going to be a different bat time, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it's going to be what is probably the most special living figuratively to date. We are heading to pretty much very close to my backyard, Warren, Ohio, to the Medici Museum to see the Norman Rockwell show of Boy Scout paintings. He's got 65 paintings that he's done for the Boy Scouts of America and Boys Life magazine over, you know, 60 years in the last century, all of them at the Medici Museum, which is this gem that nobody knows about. And this collection really rivals the collection of Norman Rockwell's at the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. So it's going to be a must, must see. And I'm trying to break the record. So far, our Living Figuratively viewer record is uh, we had 1.5K viewers when I took you to Columbus for the Mary White Show. So I'm hoping that the Norman Rockwell Show will break that record. So tell your friends, everybody, watch 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Thursday, May 20th. Um, and of course, it'll be available afterwards, you know, on my Facebook page and then for perpetuity on my YouTube channel, Judy Takas. So subscribe to that if you can't make the four o'clock. Um, anyway, come back same, same bad channel, not same bad time, four o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And all this spending the time in the bathroom has made me actually have to go to the bathroom. So I'm gonna chase you guys out of here because I have to bid you adieu. All right. Y'all come back now, you hear?